Hey, good morning. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Tupper. It is uh, Thursday, January 31st. Sounds right. Um, I'm out at a different location. Um, I assume everybody's had some peculiar weather lately. We certainly have had with uh, extraordinary cold. Um, not as cold as it is in some places uh, up north, but here in central Illinois, I know in Decatur it was out at us it was 16 below actual the other day it's been a challenge dealing with the horses we brought them into the barn and kept them in for a couple days we're going to turn them out tomorrow um, but it's been kind of goofy and the, the ground is frozen solid but that doesn't necessarily mean easy to navigate we had snow prior to that we had melting now we have ice it's been it's in, still impossible to get back on the on the Tupper Trail, if you will. Um, so, anyhow, I'm out here um, just chatting to you for a little bit after watching the um, Illinois-Minnesota basketball game last night, a game Illinois lost, played played pretty well for a half, and even a few minutes into the second half. And I kept thinking one of these teams is going to start hitting some shots, and of course it was Minnesota. They hit four threes in a stretch there, went on a, uh, what was it, a 13-1 to run, and then a 12 nothing run, a couple of big runs, and and um, Illinois could not keep up. They just really only, I, and the thing I liked about Minnesota was they had about four scoring options last night and you really didn't know where the points were gonna come from. And um, and and as uh, Brad, I went over and talked to, went over for Brad's little media scrum on uh, Tuesday. And um, you know, he was just saying Minnesota's plays different at home. They just do. A lot of, most teams do. But they shoot the ball better there. They play with a different swagger there. Um, they play faster there. And they, they channel their crowd there, just, you know, like a lot of teams. And that was a different Minnesota team than the one we saw two weeks previous when Illinois beat them by 27 at the State Farm Center. And, um, and, and you know, Illinois is still having trouble putting two halves together. There's no question they're playing better. Um, that Minnesota game, uh, I thought they were just sensational. Their best wire-to-wire -wire performance uh, last Saturday when they beat Maryland um, at Madison Square Garden. Well, they were awfully good that game, and uh, that was a breakout game for Tevian Jones and a really good game for Io. Uh, last night, the only guy who really got going was Trent Frazier, and he was sensational with 30. Um, but at the end of the game, I was sort of scratching my head asking why don't we see that kind of aggressive Trent all the time I'm not talking about a 30 point Trent I, I understand that but when he's aggressive holy cow he's a handful and, and we haven't seen it in a while and it kind of you know you kind of forget what he's capable of and he's capable of a lot and um, and I think as they move along here the you know I know, I know we've revisited this topic a number of times, but getting him and Io both aggressive uh, at the same time would certainly be to this team's benefit. I thought Io was not aggressive last night, and, you know, it's six points, and, I, and, and, and I'm, I've been trying to be careful to point out that when you analyze Io's game, if all you're talking about is the points, you're missing the point. Um, he's really good with the ball, really good defensively rebounding um, controlling the game he's so great in transition finishing um, and last night the, among their other problems and they didn't shoot the ball very well uh, certainly from three but they didn't finish at the rim last night you know Io didn't finish the way he normally can Georgie didn't get a couple to go down that kind of rolled off the off the rim um, Andres Felice uh, had a couple roll off um, so you know, it was a little bit disappointing there. The only two in double figures other than Trent last night was Andres Feliz with 11, and I believe Tevian Jones finished with 10. I loved a lot of things Tevian did last night, and I, be, and I understand that his shot was way off last night, okay? But you learn a lot about a player when you talk about and get to see how do they play on a night when their shot is haywire. And because a lot of guys... That determines how they're going to play. I'm going to shoot the ball terrible. Well, I'm going to be terrible. 
And I thought shooting was about the only thing he didn't do last night. I thought he did a lot of other things. He played hard. You know, you really appreciate two games in a row how fast he is. Against Maryland, they, they couldn't go with their two bigs all the time because Tevian ran the floor so fast, they had to get somebody else in there to try to keep up with him. And they weren't real successful doing it. Last night, I thought his worst shot of the night was either an air ball or I, it might have skimmed the rim. I'm not positive. But that's a kind of a shot where a guy slumps his shoulders and he doesn't get back on defense. Minnesota grabbed the rebound. They came flying down the floor and had a pass. It looked to me like they were going to score on a layup. And out of nowhere, here comes Tevian deflecting the ball out. Disrupted the play. Sprinted down on the, on the other, to the other end of the floor. Loved that play. And, and then, of course, the, the steal near half, near half court when he used one dribble, as our friend Stephen Bardo pointed out, uh, dribbled one time and laid it up at the other end. That was a remarkable athletic play. A um, couple of alley-oops at the rim, one a dunk, one a, just a drop-in, you know. Um, so, yeah, he shot the ball terrible. He still got 10 points. He still made hustle plays. And, uh, and he did not get in serious foul trouble. And so I saw a lot of things to like about that. I'm writing a column, be in the next couple of days. I don't know if they'll run it. Maybe Saturday morning is my guess. But um, about this freshman group, um, we've talked before about Brad Underwood and his staff's challenge to do what I call recruit uphill. Where at a time in the program's history, when you have a string of no shows in the NCAA tournament, you're not competing or even finishing in the first half of the league for Big Ten titles. You're not in the NCAA tournament. You're not in the top 25. You're not sending players to the NBA. And when you're recruiting against other teams in the Big Ten, I mean, you think Ohio State didn't tell that to E.J. Liddell? You know, why would you even consider Illinois when you tell us you want to play in the NBA? You want to be in the NCAA tournament. You want to maybe compete for a national title. You want to be in the top 25. You want to be relevant. And, and that's a tough question to have thrown in the face of a young kid. And perfectly fair, those are all truths. And so Brad and his staff have had to recruit against that mindset. And to have assembled this class is remarkable. First time in the history of the program, two true freshmen are number one and number two in Big Ten scoring. Now, after last night, uh, Trent Frazier has passed, has passed Georgie. Um, in Big Ten scoring by a little bit because of his 30 points and Georgie's nine. Um, but nevertheless, um, and now with Tevian emerging too, you have three pieces that you can see being a part of this transformational period in Illinois uh, basketball. And you add to that Trent Frazier, who is just a sophomore, and you add to that um, the anticipated arrival of Kofi Cockburn next year, um, you have... Uh, Brad and his staff really getting some serious traction now. And Georgie's a great example, you know, and a reminder. I was talking to one of the Illinois people about this the other day. You know, there's there's a group of recruits that everybody looks at and says, okay, he's going to be great. You know, Zion Williamson, you don't have to be a genius to figure that one out, right? Very hard to get him to come to your program unless you're a Duke, and Duke gets him, and okay, we all we all get that. But there's so many other players who are in that great mass of other guys who you have to evaluate and and make judgments on. And what does he have that only has him being a three star and instead of a, a high four? You know, and and you look at Georgie and and I was talking to Georgie Tuesday. First of all, his hands are so big, it's ridiculous. Second of all, Adam Fletcher, the strength and conditioning coach, thinks he can be maybe one of the strongest players he has ever dealt with, ever. Okay? He's a freshman. He's having an impact in every game, some better than others. You know, wasn't as good the other night at Minnesota, but has been, was terrific against Maryland, was terrific in the Minnesota game in Champaign. I mean, outstanding. Um, and, and we haven't seen many fresh, true freshmen do that. Many of the better freshmen, if you're going to start throwing names around, you better try to remember whether or not they actually played as a true freshman. Dion Thomas, my good friend Dion Thomas, did not play as a true freshman, okay? Corey Bradford did not play as a true freshman. Frank Williams did not play as a true freshman. A lot of these guys did not play as true freshmen. Kiwan Garris did. 
Um, but to do this as a true freshman is not easy. Um, and, you know, Trent as a true freshman made a big impact last season. Io, highly regarded, is making a big impact this season. I don't think there's ever been a player at Illinois that finishes better in transition than Io. Um, I really don't. Um, better than Frank Williams. Frank Frank made difficult shots, no doubt about that. Frank was good. I'm not I'm not demeaning Frank in any way, um, but you know Frank was terrific. Darren Williams as a true freshman averaged six points. Now, now the difference, and this is true of a lot of teams also, a lot of teams, the true freshmen who would go on to become stars had the advantage of playing with established veteran stars, okay? Darren Williams averaged six as a freshman because Brian Cook, who was the Big Ten Player of the Year, averaged 20, okay? Trent didn't have that advantage last year. Um, Io and Georgie don't have that advantage this year. And so this is a unique group. Um, and, and I'm, you know, you got to include the whole class. That means Alan Griffin and Samba Kane and Anthony Higgs. We haven't seen Anthony Higgs play. I don't know what his situation will be. He's been hurt. Um, I saw him Tuesday. I mean, he looks doughy. Um, it probably is easy for that to happen when you have foot injury and you can't do a damn thing. So, um, but in Samba, we know, needs to get stronger. And I still think Alan Griffin has a chance to have a breakout game this season. Uh, hasn't happened yet, um, but we'll see. But um, this group of freshmen, along with Trent, um, DeMonte is still in the picture here. I think Andres Feliz has developed into a guy who's a reliable component to help them uh, in their quest to win basketball games. Uh, I thought he was really good against Maryland. Um, and um, and we'll see how they go. And as you bring in Kofi Cockburn and Antoine January and whoever else Brad adds to this class. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming there'll be transfers, uh, maybe in and out. I don't know. Uh, it's just the way of the world in college sports nowadays. If you go into a, an offseason and think, well, no one's going to transfer, I think you're delusional. I mean, it might happen, but I think more often than not anymore, somebody's not going to be happy enough or, or or whatever and um and say, you know, I need to I need to go while the getting's good and then, and you don't worry about that. You just go get somebody else. Um it, it certainly would slow the process down here if Iowa were to leave after one season, but I'm hoping he sees the value in his second year of college and 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 we'll see how all that plays out, but um I'm just saying I'm I'm more encouraged than discouraged, um, and I think they're still learning how to win, and I think these final games in the regular season and whatever happens in the Big Ten tournament are going to be critical. They come back home. They play Saturday uh, at 1.15 Central Time against Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska, um, you know, is struggling right now. They just lost Isaac Copeland, who's one of their best players, lost him for the season, for the career. And, uh, man, that's tough. I feel bad about that. But if you're Illinois and going to line up against Nebraska, um, it probably makes the job a bit easier to not have to deal with with Copeland. So um, we'll see what goes on here now. Um, really tough news today, though, on the football front with, with uh, Thad Ward leaving uh, to join his friend Rod Carey at Temple. Um, Thad was a good guy, a good coach, and an excellent recruiter. He was really... Um, a, a, a listened to voice in the whole Liddyville movement, uh, the mayor of Liddyville, um, just a really good guy. And, and Lovey suddenly has some real challenges here on the staff front. Um, I don't think you like to have to try to find people at this time, and uh, maybe he can do an excellent job. But he not only needs to get good coaches, he needs to get people that these players respect and like the way they did Thad, and he needs to get really uh, dynamic recruiters. Um, still nothing on the defensive coordinator front. Um, you know, um, Lovey would say, you know, we have a plan. Well, I wish he'd share it. Um, I think we're all anxious to know what it is. But uh, anyhow, okay, that's all for now. Um, we'll see how the weather is next week. It's supposed to be like 54 or something on Monday, which is crazy uh, how quickly that, that would be a turnaround and maybe rain. So, uh, you know, if we can't get out next week because of mud, um, we'll figure out another way to do it and uh, 
in the meantime, thanks for being with us, and we'll talk to you next week. So long.